Hello, this is Eye on Africa. I'm Yena Lee, and these are your headlines on the continent tonight. Nigerian police arrest three suspects behind the Bethel Baptist School kidnapping. Over 100 students were abducted in July. 21 are still missing. African leaders blast vaccine hoarding nations at the UN's General Assembly, warning that the huge disparity in access will only prolong the COVID-19 pandemic worldwide. And Rwanda's president visits troops stationed in Mozambique. His army is one of several foreign forces fighting a jihadist insurgency in the Cabo Delgado region. Let's start tonight's show in Nigeria. Police there have arrested three suspects behind a school abduction. Gunmen overran Bethel Baptist High School in early July, kidnapping 121 students who were asleep in their dorm rooms. The attack took place just outside the city of Kaduna, in the northwest of the country. 100 teens have since managed to escape or were freed. 21 are still unaccounted for. From Lagos, France 24 correspondent Sam Olukoya has this analysis. The police described one of the three men arrested as a principal suspect. He was said to have actively participated in the planning and the abduction of the school children. The police said they recovered three AK-47 rifles, which were used during the abduction. The three suspects are facing interrogation, but the arrest of the suspects does not answer a vital question. Where are the remaining 21 children that were abducted from the school? The lack of information about these children will further heighten anxiety among their parents. 121 children were abducted from the Bethel Baptist High School in July. Over time, the gunmen who abducted them have released a number of these children in three batches, and for now, 21 children have not yet been accounted for. There were reports that a lot of money was paid to secure the release of those who have gained their freedom. It had been a most traumatic experience for the parents, especially for the parents of children who are still being held by the gunmen. The abduction of the children of the Bethel Baptist High School is one of several abductions of school children that has taken place this year in northern Nigeria. More than 1,000 students were, have been abducted this year. Some of them were killed, and some of them are still being held. About 100 school children from the federal government college, Yauri, who were abducted in June, are still being held. Parents in northern Nigeria, where these abductions have happened, have blamed the government of not doing enough. The abductions have continued because the gunmen who have carried out these abductions are getting a lot of money as ransom. But recently, the Nigerian government ordered a military operation in Zamfara State. It is unclear yet whether this operation will yield any, important, any vital uh, result. Officials in the Democratic Republic of the Congo say suspected jihadists have killed five people in Ituri province. The head of the local Red Cross says several dozen people are also missing and feared kidnapped, including a Red Cross volunteer. The attacks took place near Kumanda, just south of the provincial capital. Rwanda's President Paul Kagame kicked off a two-day visit in Mozambique. He thanked Rwandan troops who were stationed there to fight jihadists. Mozambican forces are struggling to deal with an insurgency in the north. An estimated 750,000 people have fled their homes due to the insecurity there. Some of them have now started to cautiously return, as Laurent Bersteker reports. In the village of Kitunda in northern Mozambique, life is slowly getting back to normal. Six months after fleeing from a violent jihadist insurgency, local populations have begun to return under the watchful eye of Rwandan soldiers. We fled our village and we stayed in hiding for a long time, but we were encouraged to return because security came back. A feeling of security that's largely due to the arrival of Allied forces in Mozambique. In July, Rwanda agreed to send troops to help the government fight against Al-Shabaab insurgents and was shortly followed by 16 other African countries. Last month, Rwandan defense forces said they had recaptured the strategic cities of Palma and Mosimboa da Praia and that the area was safe enough for populations to come back. We've already... Uh... Uh, repatriated uh, about 25,000 uh, internally displaced persons. 
The return of populations to Kitunda could mark the start of a long repatriation process. The International Organization for Migration says some 750,000 people are still internally displaced in northern Mozambique. Appalling, shocking, unacceptable and a situation that will make the COVID-19 pandemic last much longer. African leaders are sounding the alarm bell about the global state of vaccine distribution. At the UN's General Assembly, heads of states condemned their Western counterparts' desires to administer booster shots when less than 4% of Africa's population has been fully inoculated. It is an indictment on humanity that more than 82% of the world's vaccine doses have been acquired by wealthy countries, while less than 1% has gone to low-income countries. Unless we address this as a matter of urgency, the pandemic will last much longer and new mutations of the virus will emerge and spread. The level of vaccine in inequity that we see is appalling. It is truly disheartening to see that whilst most of our countries have inoculated less than 2% of our populace and thus seek more vaccines for our people, other countries are about to roll out the third dose, calling it booster vaccine. We tend to forget that nobody is safe until everyone is safe. 785 lives lost at sea in just eight months. The UN's migration body's official count shows that a record-breaking number of migrants have died trying to reach the Canary Islands this year. It's double the number over the same period in the same region in 2020. With heightened patrols in the Mediterranean, some migrants have been trying to reach Spanish shores opposite the Western Sahara region. Now, what COVID-19 has meant uh, that many of us around the world have been stuck at home for lengthy periods, le leading to increased use of social media. Charities, though, warn that the pandemic has caused a rise in cases of cyberbullying. And of course, Africa is no exception. This next report takes us to the Togolese capital of Lome, where our reporters met with victims of online abuse. This 26-year-old Togolese girl was harassed on social media. And Marie says that an editor, taking advantage of her inexperience, promised to publish her first book. The relationship quickly deteriorated. He started by making sexist remarks, mocking comments. He made fun of my physical appearance, things that were meant to bring me down, until the day I exploded. There are few official figures on online harassment. But according to a study conducted by Internet Without Borders, shortly before the pandemic, 45% of West African women active online were victims of sexist cyberbullying attacks. Before the pandemic, there were many cases, but it was not as pronounced as that. Lockdowns and the restrictions to movement brought in by the pandemic have seen the use of social networks in the country grow by more than 50%. Matrimoniat provides support for all survivors of cyber violence. We've had to deal with cases of identity theft, cases of physical assault. It always starts on social media. The consequences are always excruciating around us. Insults, threats, intimidation. Grace was humiliated after she posted online comments defending victims of rape and teenage pregnancy. She also spoke against those who believe African women should be submissive. I was traumatized because the people were not just attacking me. They also wanted to attack my family. I never imagined that I could feel unsafe on the Internet. None of these victims filed a complaint because online harassment is not sanctioned in Togo. There is a legal vacuum in Togo. The national institutions are struggling to keep up with the evolution of things. There is no provision in the penal code regarding cybercrime. In Turgo, the law only covers harassment and invasion of privacy.
North Africa has uh, long been thought of as a French-speaking hub, but in countries like Tunisia, its use is in decline. The capital, Tunis, is hosting the uh, General Assembly on French language books. The event is part of President Emmanuel Macron's attempts to revive French language around the world. In Tunisia, the French language is losing popularity, but authors writing in French are trying to persuade Tunisian readers to keep picking up books in their country's second language. One of them is Sami Mukaddim. An accountant by day, at night he writes fantasy detective novels set in ancient Carthage. I would like the whole French-speaking community to discover my books and discover this Carthaginian heritage that Tunisia has. And we should highlight that a Tunisian author can write a thriller because this genre is terribly lacking in Tunisia. Because of the lack of interest in reading in French, Sami had to self-publish. And even Tunisian publishers are looking to other French-speaking countries for readers, like Elisette, based in Tunis, which launched 15 years ago. When I created the publishing house, I very quickly sought to sell books in French-speaking countries. Because I found that in the 21st century, we, the male and female publishers from African countries, we can also offer text to readers in Europe. Elisette published the book by writer Emilienne Malfato that won France's top literary prize for her first novel last year. Other authors are defending French literature and culture while writing in their native Arabic. Hasuna Maspahi likes to write in the calm countryside where he was born in the Kairouan region, in the center of the country. He translates André Gide and other French poets. We are also influenced by the French language. I mean, it's thanks to the French language that we transformed and made the Arabic language evolve, modernizing it in a way, by reading Camus, Sartre, Céline, Malraux. For this author, sharing France's culture and heritage, even in Arabic, is an important way to create bridges between the different cultures. And finally, dozens of Amobe Mevege's family members, friends and fans showed up at his funeral in Yaoundé. The international broadcaster was an acclaimed connoisseur of African culture and spent his career amplifying African musicians through his work, notably here at France 24 for over a decade. He was also known for his cheeky grin and his love of making up words. Amobe died suddenly at the age of 52 earlier this month in Paris and will be buried in the land of his ancestors on Saturday. We'll leave you with these images. Stay tuned to France 24. This is a land where resilience grows, where companies who have put their faith in us know they're on firm ground, know that the roots they've put down here are growing stronger again. This is a land where confidence grows, as we continue to open doors for existing and new investors to our shores. Though we open them to a changed world, this is a land ready for the future. This is Ireland.